All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Wayne Carter, um, and I'll be followed by Zach Gramano. We're going to be talking to you about um, building applications that just work. So we'll talk why exactly apps don't work today, um, how you build apps that do. That'll follow it up by a lot of live coding. I know that's what you guys are most interested in, so we'll, we'll make sure there's plenty of time for that. All right, and then we'll follow that up with, our Q, with Q and A, so you guys can ask us whatever you'd like. So why don't apps just work? So what is it about the way that we build applications that make it that they don't work all the time? Um, and that they're not all, they're all, always fast all the time. So let's just look at that really quick. So this is a typical mobile application today, deployed with a connection to the cloud at all times, um, retrieving uh, data to drive the application um, experience. So when I have a good connection to the cloud, uh, a persistent connection that has a strong signal, then my application works as expected. It's fast, it's a good user experience, um, and users are generally happy. Now, when the connection degrades, we start seeing things like this. That's the reason we have activity indicators. It's the reason we have progress bars. They're UX, UI level um, components that let us mask the fact that we're having issues with retrieving data for application and driving the application process. So when that degrades even further, and we have no connection at all, no connection to the back end servers, we see things like this. Sorry, try back later. We're all very familiar with this. We all use it in our applications. Um, it's something we've used for a long time. It's really just to indicate to the users that we'd love to do what you want us to do, but we can't. So um, try back in a bit. All right? So what's the problem? What is it about what we're doing today that makes our apps behave this way? And it's really about UX, right? Um, we build applications that are beautiful, have beautiful experiences, really amazing user interactions, but then the network doesn't work. So um, the application is slow, or the network isn't available, so the application doesn't work. So a beautiful UI and just amazingly designed um, interaction paradigms are important to a great user experience, but they're not sufficient to create a full, amazing user experience for our users. OK, so what's the problem? Well. It's the location of data. Our data is remote, which means we're dependent on a network connection to access that data. So when it's available, we have access to our data. We're also dependent on the performance of the network. So the, the performance of the network is going to dictate how fast the application can be when we're accessing data to drive the user experience in the application. So when the connection is good, the applications typically behave as expected. But when that uh, network degrades, we have the experience like I talked about before. So it's all about remote data. So we have data in the cloud. We, OK, now we have a network connection dependency. Oh, I don't own the network. I can't really do anything about that. Um, so eh, just FOL, fact of life, right? Um, so again, what I said before, no connection, no app. Bad experience. OK, we know what the problem is. It's remote data. We're dependent on the network. Oh, OK, what's the solution? All right, the solution is data located in the cloud, just like we have today. All right, application works, application is fast when we have a network connection, but we also have something else. We have a local database that has all of the data we need to drive our user experience and drive the application available on the app. Again, when you have a good network connection, the application works as expected. You just write on the local database, it syncs in real time to the back end server and everything is exactly like you would have today. Where the difference comes in is around performance and availability. So if the network connection isn't quite fast enough to drive a great UX, well, you have disk write speed, I.O. speed, right there on your local database. So it doesn't matter how fast the, data, the connection to the backend server is. The database will serve it up in near real time and then deal with replicating to the back end as fast as it can. So we're going to do it as fast as you can using this strategy, right? And then when you don't have a network connection, everything just continues as normal. 
the application continues to work, it's still an amazing experience, the application access to the data is continuous, the read-write availability of the database is still available, and then when the connection is restored, synchronization will reconcile those two stores and um, make sure the data gets transferred as it can. Okay, so what do you need? What do you need when you wanna build applications this way and you wanna really take the user experience to the next level? You need a full stack database, right? You're gonna need a database technology that resolves the storage, access, transport, and security concerns throughout your entire stack. This isn't just about the client. This isn't just about the server. It's about the whole stack. So we have here client tier, transport, middle tier, and storage tier, all being handled by your data store technology, okay? And that's gonna be your blue sky approach to this problem. So look for something like that. And there's a lot of options in the market for this, and Zach will talk a bit about what we have to offer in our, at Couchbase, but you live in a great time. There's a lot of innovation happening in this space. You just go out, need to go out and grab it, okay? All right, and just a quick overview of just a, a little bit of commercial proof for you of, of um, some success um, being seen with this approach. Um, this is uh, a company called Ryanair. They're one of the largest airlines in the world. They hail out of Europe. Um, and they integrated actually our product. They're using this approach. They call it an uh, offline first approach. Um, it's a pretty hot um, space in the mobile first movement. Um, and this is an example of, uh, it's not an example, this is a, a demonstration of their application where they use the REST approach, a REST architecture like we all do um, on the left hand side. And they've changed to uh, an offline first approach on the right hand side where you have a hybrid app on the left using REST services to serve up. Uh, the data that they need to drive the booking process. And this booking process took over five minutes when they were looking to improve that user experience. And um, on the right-hand side, they went to a native UI, and we all know the, the, the beauties of that, and then with an offline first on their data strategy. And um, this is using Couchbase um, products underneath throughout their entire stack for both persistence, transport, storage, security, scalability, et cetera. And spoiler alert, we're on the bottom, we win, right? So um, with this, they were able to pull their, um, uh, change their full, uh, the, the full amount of time it, it uh, takes to complete a booking process from over five minutes to under two minutes. And they reduced the network traffic to drive that experience from 80 gigabytes a day down to under 20 gigabytes, I mean, sorry, down to under 10 gigabytes a day. So massive savings on the operational aspects of running the system from transport and data storage and, and all of the aspects of the, the data logistics problem, and they dramatically increase the user experience within their application uh, using this approach. Okay, we're almost done here. The last one, it cuts off at the end. Uh, the last one is the booking process. We're a couple seconds out. So an amazing, amazing, amazing experience, just night and day difference between these two. Okay, so that's it. We won. Um, this approach will always win, almost in every case, and it's gonna, it's gonna win hands down. So um, there's many, it's case after case after case of an offline first approach just dramatically be beating uh, uh, the um, service-based approaches that we've used so far. Okay, so it's ready for live code. Um, so GE, Ryanair, and many of the largest airline retail and insurance companies in the world are building amazing apps using this approach, and using the offline first approach to to applications to drive their, their business and mission critical applications throughout their entire um, enterprise. And they're both consumer and uh, employee facing. So to show you how that's done, Zach Germana, he's the original author of Couchbase Lite for .NET. He's our product manager and a Xamarin alumni. Um, we'll come up here and code with you guys. Zach. Thanks, Wayne, uh, and thanks to you all for uh, coming and joining us. Um, let's just plug in here. Okay. Man, so lucky. Okay. So um, what I would like to do uh, to get started today, rather than you know, give you a lot of uh, PowerPoint slideware and uh, a lot of uh, 
you have screenshots of code. I wanted to actually walk you through some real uh, code uh, and code that you can get uh, yourself and follow along with if you want um, or come back to it later on. So uh, up on our GitHub uh, org uh, at uh, Couchbase Labs uh, where we have um, uh, a lot of uh, uh, projects that are uh, tools related, uh, in this case uh, sample code related, uh, we have a mini hacks repo. Uh, there's actually quite a lot of stuff in there. Um, if you go poke around, um, but uh, specifically, I'm gonna walk everybody through today our kitchen sink um, uh, application, uh, if the, uh, the demo gods are willing. And um, uh, you can follow along if you like, uh, just clone the repo uh, or download the zip and then uh, navigate into the Xamarin project here. Uh, so uh, just as a little bit of high level setup here, um, uh, some of you may be familiar with Couchbase uh, through our, or uh, because of our uh, highly scalable uh, distributed data center uh, database. Uh, but uh, my product and, and Wayne's product, Couchbase Mobile, uh, allows us to extend our database out of the data center uh, or out of the, the public cloud, whether that's Azure or AWS or what have you, um, all the way to mobile devices. Um, because we all have the same sets of issues. Um, uh, we need our apps uh, to communicate uh, with the outside world, um, and, but we need to do it, as Wayne pointed out, in a way that uh, treats offline as a first-class citizen rather than trying to, you know, uh, uh, bolt something on later. Um, and uh, we need something that's fast and reliable. And to do that, uh, we have two extra components, as you mentioned here, Sync Gateway, which we won't spend too much time on today, uh, but it's enough to know that it's in effect a, a web front end for our database that lives in your uh, DMZ at your data center or, uh, as I mentioned, in, in a public cloud. Um, and that provides uh, a REST API for the database. And that REST API, in addition to being usable for you and, and your other applications, um, is also what we use uh, in Couchbase Lite to handle our replication. So um, uh, there are a couple of uh, um, key feature areas for Couchbase Lite, and we'll dive into them uh, in code uh, in just one second. Um, but the high feature, or the high level feature areas are a document or in a database, uh, which as we'll see is effectively just dictionaries in, uh, dictionaries out, uh, but with some additional services wrapped around them. Um, uh, the, the next key functional area is a, a MapReduce query engine. Um, the third major area is an event uh, I.O. stream, if you will. Um, we expose a, a, a changed event handler on the database object, on our documents, even queries, as we'll see, and that allows us to wire up our event handlers and let the UI uh, automatically redraw itself whenever data changes uh, either because of local operations or because of incoming data through sync. And then of course the last and probably the, the, the biggest uh, or most attractive functional uh, capability that Couchbase Lite provides uh, is uh, full sync and, and that's full multi-master replication. Um, so with that, um, th we have this uh, little bit of preamble here. Uh, we do have two versions of, uh, of the project uh, set up here. Um, uh, once you open it, there's a, a Xamarin iOS and a Xamarin Android project. Uh, we'll just do uh, uh, iOS uh, today for the sake of, uh, of time, um, but you can go in there and follow the instructions for both. Um, so I've gone ahead and already opened up not as big as I was hoping it would be. Um, let's try. Oh, I always forget about that. There we go. Thanks. Um, so I've gone ahead and opened up uh, the, the, the repo uh, with the project. And uh, as you'll note, uh, there's a number of steps here uh, listed in comments. Uh, when we're going through this, uh, you'll see that we've got the instructions labeled here as well. So um, you, there's no shame in copy and pasting here. Uh, and we'll talk as we go along about what it is we're actually copy and pasting and, and what that code is actually doing. Um, so uh, the easiest way to get a list of all of this is just do a quick uh, search. Uh, so you'll see down here is 
I've kind of got my list of steps we're going to be going through. Uh, so the first thing we need to do in any database-driven uh, application is we need to get a handle of the database. We need to be able to open it or create it. Um, so to do that, we'll go ahead and do that. I've already kind of taken the liberty here of um, consolidating some of these here. So the first thing we need to do is get our handle to the uh, database. So we provide a manager class, which gives you, um, uh, by default, uh, a singleton instance uh, that you can use to uh, do all the kind of normal uh, operations, uh, both kind of factory operations to get a database created, uh, but also things like being able to you know, uh, delete, uh, move, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but in this case, uh, we're just gonna, we're not gonna override any fancy values. We are gonna take the defaults, which are good for 90% of applications. Um, and we're gonna ask it for a database, in this case, called Kitchen Sink. And this is a pattern we're gonna see a lot of as we do this coding, where we have some kind of get and foo uh, method. Um, and this is gonna kind of follow a uh, 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 get or create type of semantic. You'll you'll see an absence of a lot of null checking code, and that's because uh, this is guaranteed to return back a non-null value. If the kitchen sink database doesn't already exist on disk, it's going to go ahead and create it for us. Uh, so the only way it could not return null is if it throws an exception. Um, uh, there are times, uh, uh, it's worth noting, where we do want uh, to have uh, it return null if it's not already there. Um, and in those cases, uh, as with th this method uh, and, and our other methods that follow this pattern, uh, there's a variant uh, that lets us uh, get existing foo, uh, and that one will return null, um, so you can detect that. Um, okay, so we have a handle to our database, it's now up and running. Uh, the next thing we need to do um, uh, is wire up a view. And so uh, the, th we have a couple of uh, uh, views. I'm gonna go ahead and, uh, well, we'll go ahead and set the, the view first. So uh, in Couchbase Lite, uh, because we're not working with relational data, uh, we need some way to do one of two things. Uh, we need to be able to query, uh, but in order to be able to query, uh, we need to actually have an index, because the last thing we wanna do when we wanna get information out is enumerate through a bunch of JSON and uh, blobs on disk somewhere and deserialize all of them to find our data. So just like any database, uh, we don't like doing that, we wanna use an index. Uh, so we use MapReduce uh, to do that. Now, um, a lot of people uh, uh, who uh, are coming from the relational world uh, may find that uh, the, the word MapReduce a little bit scary, but actually it's how we've already been coding. Um, so for most of you, um, yeah, if you've been doing uh, like link where and aggregate, you've already been doing MapReduce, it just was called something different. Um, so in our case, what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a view uh, that lists our items, uh, our to-do items uh, by date. Uh, to do that, all we need to do is just pass in a lambda to the map function. And inside, we're just gonna be given, when this is called, just a dictionary, because at the end of the day, for us, a, a document uh, which is our equivalent of a row, is just a collection of revisions. Every revision is just a dictionary. Um, and so we'll get passed in a dictionary of string object, and we'll be given a callback called emit. And if we want this to be indexed in this view, all we have to do is call emit, which is just key and value. In this case, uh, as an optimization just to save space, uh, all, since all we care about is the created at timestamp, we're only even gonna use keys, we're just, not, we're not even gonna use the value part. Um, so easy peasy. Uh, then there's also a, a version number here, um, so that as we change our code, uh, our map functions, uh, because here the database uh, index logic lives in C-sharp, it's not a separate language somewhere. Uh, your database code is C-sharp, so uh, we need some way to tell the underlying storage mechanism when the index just is changed and needs to get uh, rebuilt. Um, so all you have to do is just bump this uh, when you make a change and then when a user is running your app and it opens up an older version of the database, it'll just rerun the indexes, uh, no big deal. So next we need to set up a query. So we're gonna do that right here. So now that we've got a view, uh, it's just a one-liner to turn that into a query object. So that now we can actually get data out of that index. Um, 
And we're taking this one one step further to create something called a live query. So I mentioned before that one of the things that we provide uh, is uh, uh, kind of an event-driven API uh, with the changed event. Um, and live queries in particular are amazingly useful because they let us start a query, get the results back immediately um, based on what's already on disk, but it will keep running. So as the user performs local CRUD operations or as data comes in uh, via replication or via sync, um, this uh, live query is gonna uh, fire its changed event handler and that lets us uh, very easily uh, redraw our UI uh, so that as, as data is moving, uh, the UI just uh, follows. And, and as you see, this is all getting wired up when our app launches, so it's set it and forget it at this point. And if you're using things like uh, patterns like MVVM or Xamarin Forms, um, uh, having your view models uh, 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 handle these uh, uh, changed events um, is a very powerful way to be able to uh, um, program, and it reduces tremendously a lot of the cruft code that we always write. Um, so here, uh, we just wanted in descending order, so the most recent ones are up at the top. Um, and then finally, we're actually providing our uh, changed event handler, except in this case, we're just doing a simple uh, lambda. Um, and um, you, as you'll see, uh, we're getting passed in um, some event args. And uh, in addition to uh, the rows themselves, uh, we get things like uh, whether or not there was an error. Uh, if so, we can see what it was, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, here we want the rows. Um, okay, so next. Uh, we need to be able to save a new task that gets entered in. So because we're building just a simple uh, list application, Uh, once we add new items in here, we need a way to be able to save them into the database. Uh, so here we have that logic. So we're getting passed in a task, uh, or a, our, which is our to-do item. Um, and uh, in this case, um, all we're doing is again calling create document. This is the, indicating this is the first time that we've seen this uh, particular to-do item. And in this case, we don't really care what the ID is, so we're just gonna let Couchbase Lite auto-generate an ID for us. Um, but here we get our dictionary. We have just a, a nice little uh, um, extension method uh, that we created here um, that will uh, marshal our object into a dictionary. Um, and then we call and pass that into put properties. Uh, put properties is effectively our save method. Uh, so once put properties returns, we now have our, our document saved on disk. Um, and in the case where we've uh, already seen this document, uh, we just want to update it, uh, we can call get document as we saw before, um, and it will uh, 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 return uh, back our document. We can call this update method, and again, we can just pass in uh, a little uh, lambda function uh, that um, uh, updates the properties uh, that are included uh, in that uh, uh, new revision uh, and then we return to true, which effectively is sort of like a transactional commit, um, because for us, uh, saving a document is our unit of, of transaction. Okay. So let's go ahead now and jump to deleting a task. Okay, so again, uh, we just wanna get an existing document here um, and then delete it. Um, uh, this is, uh, uh, to a certain extent, uh, a, little, you know, a little pedagogical. Um, uh, we could uh, also have done something like this, but in this case, we don't wanna um, uh, uh, create the new document um, uh, because we're trying to get rid of the thing. So. Uh, in this case, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we want to have an example where, or sometimes we have scenarios where we want to know if it's null uh, so we can uh, um, uh, take a, a correct action. In this case, um, we're doing it here so we don't automatically create a document just to only delete it. All right.
Okay, so next uh, we need to wire up our data source. Uh, so in this case, um, we have our uh, task updated event handler uh, that was getting created by our, our helper class here, task manager. Task manager is actually in a shared project here, so it makes it very easy for me to use the same implementation uh, in both uh, uh, the uh, iOS version and the Android version. And so you see we have it added in both cases. Uh, so it makes it very easy for us to um, use the same code uh, across both. Uh, we're not, in this case, using any platform specific types. Um, so um, yeah, we don't have to even worry about things like if stepping. Um, okay, so uh, we've got our, uh, our, our event handler firing. Um, we're uh, returning our, or setting our rows and uh, we're telling the uh, table view to reload its data. Okay. So in our app, we want to be able to toggle a check mark uh, based on whether an item's done just by tapping on the row uh, in the, uh, the UI table view. Uh, so in this case, um, it's very straightforward for us. Um, we just want to uh, um, save the task uh, that's being returned back uh, uh, when we uh, look it up from our list of tasks. Um, we're just toggling the Boolean value property on it uh, and then saving it. So uh, nothing too fancy happening there. Okay, and then when we wanna be able to swipe to delete, uh, again, um, very straightforward. Uh, we're just finding the list of rows uh, that we've already uh, retrieved before and then calling delete task on our task manager delete, um, which was that uh, get existing document and then delete. Okay. So uh, we've handled the, the local CRUD operations here. And actually this is a good time for us to see how we're doing here. We should if all uh, is going well. Um, good, we've got our Okay, so we now have our check marks. Uh, we now have everything persisting. Um, everything's solid there. So now we wanna go ahead and take the next step, uh, which is to sync enable this. So to do that, we first need a sync URL. So in this particular case, I'm just gonna use uh, localhost, um, but this is the uh, URL uh, to your, actually it is, um, uh, to your sync gateway. So uh, I have a little script right here. Um, uh, this will uh, be committed up shortly. Um, it's actually located in another directory, but for convenience, uh, uh, we'll push up one that's located in the, uh, the Xamarin project folder. Uh, but all I need to do is call sync gateway start. And in this case, um, in this case I've already got it running on another, tab. Um, so I have our little admin console running um, and um, you'll see uh, once we're done syncing that we'll have our list of documents showing up here. Um, and we can see lots of uh, crazy stuff happening here so that's uh, letting us know Sync Gateway is running. Um, when you run this script it's actually going to download uh, Sync Gateway for you uh, and it'll just unzip it into a temporary folder in that uh, um, uh, working directory. Uh, there's also a clean command, so when you're done, it'll actually remove everything off your uh, hard drive uh, so that there's zero touch uh, when you're done, if you like. Um, okay, so uh, we've got our, uh, our sync function, or our, sorry, our, uh, our sync URL added in now. So now uh, we need to go ahead and wire it up in our application. Okay, so uh, we're getting our, uh, our URL coming in um, uh, as a path uh, based on what the, um, uh, 
uh, what was being passed uh, during startup, uh, converting it to a URI, and then in our database, our Couchbase Lite database uh, object, we're call creating uh, two uh, distinct replication objects. One is a pull replication that's gonna pull changes uh, that are made in Sync Gateway down to our instance of the application. We're also creating a push replication uh, so that we can uh, take our changes that we're making locally and push them up uh, into Sync Gateway into the database. Um, you'll notice that both of those are manageable independently. So if your application only needs to do things like uh, push up some r logging information uh, when the app is shutting down, uh, there's no need to uh, waste uh, battery or on uh, keeping the network running just to have a pull replication doing nothing. And in both cases, we're gonna set this continuous. So we have uh, two ways of running a replication. One is to continuously be handling changes, uh, um, either push or pull, uh, that are coming in uh, throughout the application's life cycle. Um, but as we all know, keeping the, the network uh, interfaces running is the quickest way to drain your battery, or your uh, application's battery, I'm sorry, your, the, the phone, your user's phone's <laughs> battery. Um, so uh, there are times when we need to do it uh, because we have latency sensitive information like maybe a chat app, for instance. Um, but a lot of times we don't. We have more um, uh, latency tolerant uh, data flows like maybe some customer information that doesn't change too often, things like that. Um, so we can tailor uh, the, the way sync is working based on, on our data flows uh, to minimize resource us usage. Uh, so then we go ahead and call the start method here. And then last but not least. We're gonna go ahead and call this here. So. Looking here, uh, hopefully we'll see a bunch of activity once the app is running here. And of course the demagogues are not smiling. Um, so yeah, one of the things you have to be careful too about is, um, oh no, it's in the wrong spot. Uh, looks like I made a mistake here. We're uh, in putting my start method, I think. Ah, there we go. Helps if I uh, copy paste correctly. It's kind of a basic skill these days. All right. So now we see our app is running. Hopefully uh, we saw a bunch of stuff go by. We did, uh, which is great. So we, we see a bunch of uh, activity from uh, the Sync Gateway and there we go. So now we see our document showing up here and we can see my hello of all. Now, another cool thing is that uh, I can fix my uh, spelling mistake here and save a new revision. I see my revision number now has changed. And going back to the app, I see now my uh, lowercase hello is now an uppercase hello. Um, so uh, that's it, that's the basic up and running. That's building a complete app uh, in, uh, in about 20 minutes here. Um, so uh, we can uh, handle a lot of other uh, uh, much more sophisticated use cases, but uh, even the most uh, sophisticated apps that we've seen customers built uh, aren't too far off from what you see here. Um, uh, some of the capabilities uh, that you'll be able to explore are uh, adding um, uh, data routing. Uh, we have an RBAC model so that you can secure data as it's being synced from uh, uh, you know, thousands uh, of devices so that user A doesn't uh, inadvertently get access to user B's data, um, all this kind of stuff. Um, but um, you know, maybe we'll save that for, for a follow-up. Uh, but at any rate, I appreciate uh, your time. Um, and with that, uh, does anybody have any questions with the uh, about five minutes that we have left?
the question was, is there a way to encrypt the database on device? Uh, yes, there is. And in fact, if you go in uh, to NuGet even, uh, when you add in a Couchbase Lite, you'll see uh, an option for uh, SQL Cipher, uh, which many of you are familiar with. We are actually shipping uh, the native binaries for that, so it just works. Uh, whether you're on Windows, uh, whether you're on you know, targeting iOS or Android. Um, uh, we also uh, have, uh, in preview release, our new uh, KV storage engine called ForestDB. It's a major improvement uh, in the state of the art of uh, uh, databases uh, over SQLite, which is our historically uh, the, the storage engine we've used. Uh, it too has uh, and ships with AES-256 uh, encryption on disk. Um, so uh, in the case of ForestDB, if you're using the, the ForestDB storage engine, uh, that information will already be there. You're still responsible for key management though, um, but uh, hopefully you're putting that in the uh, iOS or Android keychain. Great question. Yeah. Across the wire, yes. Uh, so the question was, uh, does it encrypt across the wire? Yes, so as full support uh, set up for um, uh, SSL, uh, though not really SSL anymore, it's uh, TLS. Um, so we do things like uh, mitigate the poodle attack, so we disable actually the use of SSL3, um, and uh, shortly SS or TLS uh, 1.0. Um, so uh, yeah, great question. Um, uh, so the question uh, was, is there a way to horizontally or vertically slice the database? Uh, so uh, the MapReduce views are the primary way of doing that. So if I want to view just, let's say, employee records, uh, I would set up my MapReduce view uh, to only index uh, the documents where I have like a type uh, key and the value is employees, something like that. So that way when I run my query and, and uh, use one of our uh, uh, adapters, um, or, uh, or you're wiring it up yourself, you're only looking at employee databases. In the channels feature that I uh, made a, a quick reference to on Sync Gateway lets us do that, uh, but at scale. Excuse me. Oh, real quick question over here. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, sort of that's designed uh, by default. We always assume that the network is probably gone. Uh, if some of you are familiar with the eight fallacies of distributed computing, number one is the network is always available. Um, and that's the beauty of uh, working with Couchbase Mobile. All of your reads and writes are always done locally, so it's always fast. Uh, you know, uploading a 15 megabyte uh, ping file, you know, takes, you know, a handful of milliseconds as far as the user is concerned. Uh, but in the background, we're using all of the uh, network reachability APIs uh, that are available to us on the given platform uh, to detect whether or not we actually are able to sync. If it's not and you're running, let's say, a continuous replication, we automatically suspend it. When the network comes back, we resume it. Um, and if, if something, a document was getting sent mid-flight and got you know, cut off, we'll you know, resend it. And we do all of that work, so it just goes away for you. That's all pushed down into infrastructure. Good question. Uh, the question was, uh, are file attachments automatically chunked? Uh, not yet. Um, uh, you can do that in user land uh, fairly easily, uh, but it is on the roadmap, yes. Uh, there was a question over here. Oh, I'm sorry. Do we have an asynchronous? Yeah. Um, on some of them we do, uh, like for instance on query run, we have a query run async. Oh, okay. uh, and like for instance, the database update uh, uh, is actually uh, uh, async as we noted with the lambda we pass in. That's part of the reason it needs to have a, a Boolean return values because that's gonna be a deferred uh, async value. Actually underneath it, it's getting wrapped in a task uh, and getting set to a scheduler.
Oh, okay. Yeah, so um, you know, if you want to do things like uh, time-based uh, synchronization, um, what you would do is not use continuous mode, uh, but instead uh, just use what we call one-shot mode, where you start it, it syncs everything up to now, and then it's done. Um, and then just set like a, you know, a system timer and, uh, uh, and then just call that w on whatever your, your kind of callback basis is. Uh, maybe we can, uh, why don't we follow up after? I'll be happy to talk a little bit more in depth because I think we can probably squeeze in one other question. Um, yeah. Ah, Nickel, yes. Okay, so for those of you who aren't familiar, um, uh, Couchbase Server uh, has a uh, SQL, um, uh, ANSI SQL compliant uh, query language uh, with some extensions for querying against document data. Uh, for us, it will be a link implementation uh, in Couchbase Lite, uh, but yes, we are gonna be working on that this year. Um, so yeah, great question. Okay, well thanks again everybody, I really appreciate it, and if you have any questions, please come see us at our booth, we'll be happy to, to talk as long as you care to. <laughs>